Hello and welcome to another mining podcast with me, Paul Harris and Joe Mazumdar. Hello, Joe. How are you? Happy New Year, Paul. How's it going? Happy New Year, Joe. Very well. Today we're talking about lithium. Lithium has been on a tear. There's been a lot of M and A activity. It's a, a product that's very much in the headlines, not just in the mining sector, but in this broader business media. And today we have the great pleasure to be joined by a specialist, uh, Murray Brooker from Australia, a lithium consultant and QP. Hello, Murray. Hi, Paul. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, to start with, Murray, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? You know, who are you and what do you do? Okay, well, well basically, I'm a, I'm a geologist and hydrogeologist that specialises in, in lithium salt lakes. Uh, so basically, I, I figure out where to go looking for lithium and uh, where, you know, what drilling is required. And then I define resources and, and ultimately reserves so we can get lithium to people's hands and put it into cars and phones. Well, thank you very much. Um, as, as I mentioned in the introduction, lithium prices have been on a tear. Um, lithium prices were on a tear back in 2018, and, and that fizzled out. So why, why are prices on a tear now, and how is this time different from, from last time? Effectively, what, what's happened now is, is that uh, the, the demand is, is catching up with supply. And, and so we, we have this, uh, this shortfall in, in uh in supply and beyond that we have people realizing that they really need to lock in uh, contracts and supply for the longer term so there's somewhat of a, a, a catch-up going on and and desperation to to basically lock down supply before um, it's not available so that's really contributing to push prices up very strongly at the moment and uh, it's it's something that we knew was going to play out but the timing of it playing out was, was never clear and a lot of people were standing on the sidelines and now they've, they're, they're really desperately having to rush in and, and, uh, and, and act. And so that's all contributing to this very rapid increase in, in pricing and, and investor demand. Thank so you. do you think there's still more room on the pricing? Yeah, the, um, the the pricing is is increased, you know, very significantly. Uh, really kicking off about November last year, there was there was a, 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 a sorry, November twenty twenty, there was a, a turnaround in, in in interest, and and since then we've we've sort of seen rapid revaluation of, of companies, and also the, the product pricing has been increasing significantly. So and also, be... sorry. Uh, oh, carry on. Just the the underlying uh, that we've seen besides the pricing is is the M and A activity, and so can you go into a bit of that? Like we've seen, uh, you know, like one thing I've been looking at is expiration expenditures, and uh, one one thing that uh, you know stood out to me is how much expiration expenditures are being directed to Argentina, and and the proportion that's actually being directed to lithium in Northwest Argentina in terms of the brines. So in terms of the M&A, we've seen Argentina being a focus, and we've also seen uh, the Chinese being a major suitor. Is, is that a trend that we're going to see continue? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Joe. I mean, uh, with, the, with regards to, to the, the projects and investment and, and M&A, I, it's, it's a case of these projects have been around for quite some time now. People have known which which are the the the, the, uh, the better projects and, and the bigger ones, but but people have been cautious about the market outlook, and as that sort of firmed up, and as and as um, people have come in with with longer term view, uh, the MA M and A project project activity is sort of eventuated. I mean, what what we what we see is that um, the, the Chinese companies in particular have a longer term focus. They, they know there's, there's a massive electrification going on. And, and so they've been prepared to invest in, in projects, particularly in Argentina, earlier than other players. And so what, what we've seen is that they've just um, picked off these projects when, when other investors have, have been um, reticent to, to put the cash there. So we, we, we've seen... Um, this engine buy into the, the three Q project, and uh, and then we've seen a lot of activity around the millennial um, 
project in Pastos Grandes, but eventually the Lithium America is taking that out. And there's a whole lot of speculation as to whether that's really uh, funded by Gang Feng at the end of the day. And, and Gang Feng have been a very focused uh, and committed player and really have, have developed their presence very strongly in, in Argentina and, and the rest of the world. So they've really taken a long-term view and I think they'll really be rewarded because they've, they've, they've got in there, they've bought into these projects, they're going to they're gonna develop them. So they'll have a massive supply pipeline. And, and the M&A is just going to continue, but I think what we've, we, and we've seen Rio Tinto now uh, just recently buy Rincon, which perhaps um, was, was a surprise to many people uh, with a non-traditional lithium player. We'll probably see more of that sort of thing, but really, at least in Argentina, the, the, the real elephants uh, are sort of now almost all in the hands of Major major companies and the ultimate developers. So we're going to, we're going to see a lot of tussling over the remaining projects, and and uh, and and that's going to be very interesting to watch. Thank you, uh, Murray. Now, th th those transactions, recent transactions you mentioned, have been for lithium brine projects. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a flurry of M and A for uh, spodumene projects, uh, particularly in Australia. What, what, why is the the, the, the M&A action moved from spodumene to, to brine? Uh, well, I think the, the, the that, that that's driven by a, a number of things. I mean, one of them is the uh, the advantages of of the lithium brine projects and and uh, the fact that they're supplying lithium carbonate, which uh, is is um, no 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 longer the um, Lesser desirable of, of the lithium products, uh, and and it has a better ESG um, credentials. But but the the, the the same time we're seeing a lot of activity uh, here in Australia for hard rock active uh, hard rock um, spodumene. There's there's an enormous amount of press on a daily basis around someone doing a deal to get into a project which has got some pegmatites on it. Um, the company prices are flying sky high, and so there's there's also a lot of activity around um, spodumene. Even even though we saw massive amount of, of spodumene development going back about three years, and that's what drove the market into um, the the price decline because there was this massive increase in in, in supply. Now that's that's uh, that that's there, but that's being absorbed. So. We're now looking at sort of growing the next generation of of Australian lithium projects, and that'll that'll take a while. And and so, uh, any any future supply coming out of those is, is going to be some way off. So, just getting back to what you were saying about lithium carbonate coming back, and hence brines coming back. Like when I met you last, I think it was in Northwest Argentina several years ago, uh, looking at uh, lithium projects, the last price spike. But then there was a transition to lithium hydroxide, which, which like you said, spodumene works better to uh, generate. And also, I believe Oro Cobre built a plant in Japan to actually convert some of their lithium uh, carbonate into lithium hydroxide. But now you're saying lithium carbonate isn't uh, such like a, a price discount. So what, what's driving that demand for lithium carbonate now such that you know it's looking as good or better than lithium hydroxide? Well, well what was happening was that the investment markets were really trying to pick the winner in the battery space. And, and in terms of energy intensity and things, the, the, uh, the nickel battery base was, was really um, favored in that, in that sense. But as, as you know, battery technology has got better, what we've seen is that um, the, the LFP batteries, which are, are effectively um, being, being produced with lithium carbonate feedstock, uh, have, have become very um, strong um, players, if not the dominant player in, in, in China. Uh, and so effectively that's been underpinning the demand for lithium carbonate. And so if we go back those couple of years, Joe, we saw a lot of analysts taking the view that, oh, well, actually lithium hydroxide is going to be the most desirable product, and that's coming out of hard rock projects. So we really want to be in hard rock projects, despite the fact that they, they were 
you know, the higher OPEX projects. Um, but, you know, more recently, as I say, the pendulum's kind of swung back a bit to, towards uh, carbonate. And, and so that's really supporting um, lithium, lithium carbonate um, production in the future and pricing. So in terms of brine projects, I mean, like like in terms of exploration for anything, you know, we're looking undercover and, you know, we don't really know what's there until we until we drill it. But, you know, the brines, um, sorry, the solars that host the brines uh, are basically pretty obvious. So is this some of this just a land grab of getting as many of the solars in places that you think you can extract? Because I know Chile has some issues with with uh, uh, brines and lithium uh, production. Uh, Argentina seems to be better. Is is just picking up anything in northwest Argentina uh, uh, the go? And then and then is 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 Bolivia ever going to come into play? Yeah, I mean, as, as you said, the, the nice thing about Salt Lakes is, is that you can you can see them from thirty thousand feet, um, and and. So then, it's really a matter of of seeing uh, how that how they deliver, and and not all salt lakes are, are, are equal, of course. So some of them, some of them have substantially higher lithium concentrations naturally than than others, and and lithium is a little bit like a you know a high value bulk commodity in the sense that, like a lot of other things, it's it's also the impurities that are important, uh, particularly in the in in the traditional uh, evaporation pond treatment method. So we're, we've always been concerned about magnesium, um, boron, calcium. We, we need to get that stuff out for, for the final um, final product. And magnesium in, in particular has been uh, it's something that that is 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 um, you know one of the key impurities to remove. Now that's the and, and so higher magnesium to lithium ratios have traditionally been regarded as a, a, a sort of negative attribute from uh, from, from processing certain point of view and adding to the cost. And, and really the view has kind of been that if you've got magnesium to lithium above 10 uh, in terms of a ratio, then the economics are not really going to work. Now what, what we see uh, in, in, in you know, the, the fast developing technology world is that lithium carbonate, uh, sorry, lithium extraction technologies of direct extraction uh, can, can effectively get around the, the, the issue of, of relative impurity concentrations. And, and so lithium, uh, direct lithium extraction is, is kind of the, the holy grail for the, for the industry in terms of, of opening up new frontiers with salt lakes that previously weren't amenable. Uh, and and there's an enormous amount of work going on, and, and I've lost track of how many processes are in development for for direct lithium extraction. But there's there's a lot of work happening there, and what we shouldn't lose sight of is is that people have actually been using direct lithium extraction techniques for sort of over 20 years. I mean, Livent in Argentina uses a process where you know effectively they are extracting lithium. Um, uh, in 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 a way that it's it's uh, you know a, a, a direct lithium extraction technology and and so there, there, there are technologies out there that have proven to be viable and and um, and we're going to see a lot more of it and and so it, it, there's still a question as to which of these technologies are really uh, going to be the winners and of course there'll, there'll be more than one but. Um, We'll see a lot of the new generation of projects being based around direct extraction technology, and, that, and that's where companies like you know Lake Resources uh, interacting with with Lilac Technologies are um, a sort of interesting space to watch because that's that's really where a lot of new generation projects are heading. Just a question. Sorry, sorry, Paul. I just could you explain? The difference between how it's done now, with respect to the ponds and and the evaporation versus direct extraction, and how direct extraction eliminates, uh, you know, uh, the uh, you know the, uh, the 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 contaminants, the things you want to avoid, like like uh, magnesium. Yeah, sure. I mean, the 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 
the traditional pond method effectively involves constructing kilometer, square kilometers of ponds uh, you know, for a typical project size of say 20,000 tons of, of lithium carbonate, the, there's probably in the order of $100 million worth of expenditure in the ponds and the, the, the liner. And, and the liner is, is basically a special HDPE product, which um, is, is there to prevent leakage from the ponds. It's expensive to buy and, and install. And that's a pretty significant part of the um, the pond construction, although there's a lot of civil works that go on there. So, so those, those ponds are a, a chunk of capex that um, can be reduced significantly with the direct extraction. I mean, often you'll still need ponds with direct extraction. Uh, some people, the plan is is to to evaporate the salt, um, and so they still need ponds, but they don't need to be lined. Uh, other other players are looking at re-injecting the spent brine after the processing plant and stripping out the lithium. And so that's, a, that's another option which removes the, the, the pond um, requirement almost entirely, but involves having reinjection wells. So those, those are kind of the, the options there. And the, the process plant, there's really about three different types of, of, um, of direct extraction um, methodology. But, but effectively what it means is that you're pumping your brine into a plant, it's going through <clears throat> a lot of big tanks and absorption columns or selective membranes uh, or, or some sort of solvent extraction uh, system. And then you, you pump your um, spent brine out the back of the plant and dispose of that. And, and the lithium is, is captured on a particular medium, which often you'll have to wash the lithium off <clears throat> and then you have much more concentrated lithium that's that's then subsequently upgraded and and you produce your your final lithium product. So people talk about the you know eighteen month period from uh, in a traditional operation of pumping brine into a pond, evaporating it and putting it into the plant versus the direct extraction, which is on the order of of let's say twelve hours. Um, but and, and and people make a big deal of that. But but really that 18 months is built into the construction time frame of the project. So you build your build your ponds first, build your wells first, then you're building the, the processing plant. And and so that 18 months is kind of absorbed in the construction phase of the project. So it really doesn't make any difference um, in terms of timing, but people will talk about that a lot. Oh, because you have to build the plant anyway. Yeah, that's right. You've got to build a plant anyway. So it's all about scheduling to get brine to the plant um, um, before the plant, you know, when the plant's ready to operate. Okay. As, as we've mentioned, sort of prices at a sort of lithium are at sort of record highs. Um, are, are they forecast to stay at these levels? Are we at the sort of new baseline or are they forecast to fall at some point in the future? And I guess the reason I asked there is because uh, at higher prices, um, projects with more or a greater abundance of impurities, you know, can be viable if, if you know, extracting impurities is often just a, a cost at the end of the day. That, that, that's right. I mean, what, what we're seeing is, is that, uh, you know, the price is up, the, the price forecasters are, are, are saying, okay, well, the price is going to stay up for, for, you know, in the future, so we're going to have a, a higher consistent um you know, long-term pricing, although of course there'll be ups and downs, and and uh, and so the, the 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 market demand is is continuing to grow, and and so new project development is is going to be um, in in tandem with that to to meet the demand. And what we've seen in the past is when there's been a slackening off of interest in the sector and. and lack of investment coming in that results in you know a, a, a greater lag time for the next next development and and so that has an impact on prices and so the 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 period where we've we've seen less interest in lithium prior to sort of November um, 2020 um, you know that sort of lag period of investment is, is 
is going to have had a downstream effect in terms of of, of slowing down lithium um, lithium development. So that that'll all contribute to keeping the price high in the future. So, uh, you know, like the, the cure for uh, higher prices is higher prices. And uh, I guess the question is, you know, lithium is not that rare. There's a lot of you know, lithium around. It, it, the, the, the issue is getting it into the product that battery manufacturers need. But do you see it in, in a period of higher consistent lithium prices that we might have an issue where something huge comes on? and occupies that demand shortfall and gives us a glut in the market. Do you see that being being a potential risk or not? No, no, not any. I, I don't see that anytime soon, Joe. I mean, you know, there's there's some monsters out there. As we know, there's the ABG project in, in uh, the DRC. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's not, you know, producing... Um, you know, right, right now, and and um, these you know projects all, always take a while to ramp up. So, uh, what you know, what this is all stimulating is more activity in in spodumene in in Western Australia and, and Canada, where we we kind of thought that that was all over. We were seeing a new generation happening there. Of course, we've still got projects like Bacanora. Um, to, to you know come on and, and produce lithium from from clays we've got the Nevada lithium clay projects um, things things like the um, Ioneer project up in in uh, I think Nevada where we've we've got um, lithium in volcanic ash units and 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 so there's there's a lot of um, other projects that are out there and and um, can find their way to market, particularly if the prices stay high and they can cover high high opex on on, uh, on production. Okay, so, so I guess like uh, the starts and stops of the lithium market. I guess can we summary and say say uh, that's ended right now, and this is the beginning of of the need for lithium to feed that electric vehicle battery is uh, are we now well on our way is that what you think yeah look i mean i've been in the lithium game for quite a while now and i think we've seen at least five sort of major price cycles in terms of in terms of stock markets at least in investor investor interest and reward um you know on the back of the the cop 26 um meeting and 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 the the sort of general um, green economy becoming mainstream. Uh, we, we've just seen this big increase in, in interest in, in in the sector and everything related to um, effectively cleaner power generation and, and batteries are along with that. So I, I think it's now we, we've sort of in the process of, of of going mainstream, and I think we we may have you know hit the tipping point uh, in, in terms of, of that. So there's there's been a few false dawns with with lithium, that's for sure. But um, my my reading is is that this time it's it's for real. We've, we've sort of got the momentum we we need. So a uh, final question for me is that you know with all this M and A, what would you say like like I'm trying to figure out is 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 anything going to be taken out now, or are there characteristics? that you think make a project uh, more likely to be taken out, like whether it's size, location, you know, chemistry, like what, what sort of things, attributes do you look at to say, oh, that's a project that can happen, that's a project that's not going to happen, even if the price changes? Yeah, I mean, certain, certainly size is, is, is a consideration, and we've sort of seen the elephants being gobbled up by the, the you know, the eventual developers certainly in Argentina re recently and you know going back a couple of years uh, in, in Western Australia as well so that, that that's a key consideration um, and also opex and, and capex um, it's there's going to be an interesting transition in terms of traditional processing technology for brine to to direct extraction and and how people will be assessing that and backing that. But I think um, people will be 
just backing it on on its technical merits and, and detailed evaluation. We've seen that with with Rincon, um, which has a you know direct extraction technology. So that I, I think that's less of an impediment than, than, than it used to be. Ge Geography has been an interesting one. I mean, you know, Argentina has really stolen the march on Chile and and Bolivia because there there, there has been effectively um, the opportunity for exploration companies to get on and explore and, and, and develop. From what we've seen in both Chile and Bolivia is uh, effectively politics get in the way of geology. And, and uh, so that's had a, a really you know, negative impact for development in both of those countries because the, the, the politics has, has really prevented um, a lot of activity there and, and some money's flowed to Argentina and Western Australia and to some extent to Canada uh, as a result. Thank you. Uh, my final question for you, Murray, with the uh, direct lithium extraction technology, is that something that in the future we may see retrofitted to existing operations or, you know, because of its, its benefits of an increasing production, you know, not being such an issue with the impurities, et cetera, or is it, you know, because you've got this, companies have this sunk investment in the ponds that they'll stick with that. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of companies in the current uh, market will certainly be thinking about expanding operations and, and how they can fine tune things. So, Yes, I'd, I'd absolutely expect um, yeah, companies already in production to be looking at, at, at direct extraction as, as sort of a, a next phase of their development. So, yeah, very very much the, the case, and, and they're probably the ones that are going to be actually driving the the um, you know the construction and, and, and implementation of some of these new technologies. Excellent. As, uh, thank you very much, Mike. It's been a, a fascinating conversation. Thank you for sort of going into all the different ins and outs for us. Um, that's all we've got time for on this edition of Another Mining Podcast. Murray Brooker, thank you very much. Joe Mazunda, thank you very much. <laughs>